Hi. Our next presentation is going to be Brainstorm BCLI. To my right is Dr. Tony Fiorino. He is an MD, PhD. He's a very interesting guy because he comes to Brainstorm from the venture capital world. What I really like is that he understands medicine and kind of understands uh, the value proposition of the space. Uh, Brainstorm is a very interesting company. It's one that Maxim has been involved with with a couple of years. And, you know, I've been following very closely the ALS space. I've actually visited Brainstorm in Israel. I've seen their production facilities. I've met with patients who've had the therapy. And, and I do believe it's a very, very interesting name in the ALS space. And so we're going to talk a little bit with Dr. Tony about what is the Brainstorm strategy, what's the philosophy, and how does it differ from some of the other companies in the, lands in, in the landscape. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me. So uh, I'll spend a couple of minutes, I really have just a couple of slides um, to, uh, to uh, run through here. Um, I will be making, or maybe making, forward-looking statements. Um, really, um, I think in, to encapsulate uh, what Brainstorm is, um, I view us as a differentiated stem cell company. And by that, I mean we are indeed using mesenchymal stem cells, um, but we have a proprietary culture process by which we induce these mesenchymal stem cells to produce a variety of growth factors, neurotrophic factors that are, uh, have been shown to be important in promoting neuronal survival. Uh, so what we have, in essence, when we administer these cells back to patients, is a, a mesenchymal stem cell-based drug delivery system for neurotrophic factors, uh, which is covered by a, a extensive uh, series of patents on the cells, uh, methods of producing them, and methods of use. Uh, we are in phase two in ALS. We received fast-track status from the FDA last year. Uh, we've completed two, two Israeli clinical trials. I'll show you a little bit of data from those trials. And we're currently enrolling a phase two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial at Mass General, UMass, and Mayo Clinic. Uh, we plan to launch a multi-dose study uh, later this year uh, in Israel. We, um, in addition to the ALS program, we have a variety of preclinical proof of concept models um, in Parkinson's, Huntington's, uh, recently autism, MS, and other peripheral nerve injury models. And we'll be looking to move additional programs into the clinic over the course of uh, 2015, 2016. And uh, most importantly, or one of the most important things for any uh, biotech company, we are well financed right now. We raised capital in, uh, in January of this year, and we are uh, financed uh, well beyond the readout of our phase two study in 2016. Uh, so really, this is the one, uh, one slide that I'd like to show with... So with I'm going to stop you okay. before we get into data, and I definitely want... Why don't you back up one slide before we talk too much about data? I'd like to understand, just in my own terms, what Brainstorm does. So you're taking uh, mesenchymal cells from the patient, so it's autologous, right? Correct, from bone and, marrow. And, and you're essentially bringing them into the lab, you're working on them, and you're turning them into what I like to characterize as super secretors of neutrophic factors, like BDNF and GDNF, so far correct, right? right precisely. Okay, and, and then you're reintroducing them, and I think here's where bra another area where Brainstorm differentiates itself. How are the patients still return back to the ALS patient? Uh, so uh, we, the, the, a after the several week long culture and differentiation process, uh, we, we administer the cells. Currently, we've administered both intramuscularly and intrathecally. Um, and, and, and most of the patients in our studies have received both intramuscular and intrathecal administration. Um, and, and those are the routes of administration uh, that will go forward. Intrathecal seems to be where the clinical action is. Right. So, and let's just define for me intrathecal, which is delivering into the cerebral spinal fluid. But Cor correct. It's a subarachnoid, uh, into the subarachnoid space. So it's administered via a lumbar puncture, which is a very, very routine procedure that any neurologist uh, uh, performs, uh, you know, uh, as I said, on, on a routine basis. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we think that the, uh, the advantage of intrathecal administration is, is just that, that it, it, it's easy and safe and can be performed by a neurologist uh, in an office. Okay, so we have a very, very safe route of administration. We have the patient's own cells, and they essentially become 
altered or manipulated, but in a good way, where they become super secretors of BDNF and GDNF, and the idea being that these are mesenchymal cells which like to home, so is the idea that they then fly around the cerebral spinal fluid and kind of home to different places in the right. body? So, so MSCs do have a homing function. They tend to home to sites of injury um, you know, and, and possess also immunomodulatory uh, properties as well and many, many clinical trials in MSCs and various inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. So we think that um, it certainly may be uh, an immunomodulatory component to the, to the cells, uh, and, and as you uh, mentioned, you know, the, these cells are secreting high levels of BDNF, GDNF, VEGF, and HGF, all of which have been shown to be important in promoting neuronal survival, and so what we, uh, what we hope is going on is that the, that the, the CSF is, uh, the, 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 these growth factors are being secreted into the CSF and, uh, and are able to be taken up uh, in the neuronal cell bodies of the lower motor neurons, which reside uh, in the spinal cord, um, and there um, are hopefully uh, prolonging the survival of these neurons. And, and when you deliver intrathecally, at the same time, do patients also get intramuscularly? So help me understand that administration and how so, that connects right. with, with intrathecal. So, so in the clinical trial in the U.S. and in the um, phase 2A trial in Israel, uh, patients received both, and it's, it was done simultaneously. Uh, first, the intramuscular injection followed injections uh, several sites in the biceps and tricep, uh, and, and followed by the... Uh, by the intrathecal administration. So, you know, striking to me because the other Israeli company that was in this room with me this morning was Pluristem, and Pluristem has also been an advocate that MSCs, when delivered intramuscularly, uh, uh, allow the cells to be trapped, but yet read the local environment and still secrete their cytokine profile and exert their trophic effect. So it's kind of the thinking is the same. Uh, yes, and there's also, you know, in ALS in particular, um, there is evidence that neurotrophic factors can be taken up in the neuromuscular junction and undergo, undergo retrograde transport back into the spinal cord, and that was an, a piece of the rationale uh, for intramuscular administration in these patients. All right, so now the, the other second critical piece to me of brainstorm is, and, and you know, help me understand your due diligence when you took over as CEO. Uh, what their manufacturing operation was like in Israel, and what had to happen for you to initiate these clinical programs in the United States? Uh, so, um, I, I first, I have to give kudos to our manufacturing team, who, who has been really outstanding at taking what was a, a, a process developed in a laboratory and building it over the course of uh, several years into a GMP manufacturing process that allows us to treat uh, humans in, in clinical trials. And the, um, the manufacturing process, as it currently stands, uh, um, is, a, is about a four-week-long process uh, in which the, the, the bone marrow aspirate is obtained, we separate the MSCs, they're expanded for several weeks, and then it's a one-week differentiation process uh, before the cells are ready to be administered. And that process was transferred to our two manufacturing sites in the U.S., and um, you know, they have done an outstanding job in terms of building in in-process controls, uh, development of release testing, and uh, we, we are um, you know, very well positioned to move this process to the next step, which will involve production of multiple doses out of a single bone marrow aspirate. This is something that we're in the process of validating currently, and we'll look to put into clinical use in Israel this year in a, in a clinical trial as well as uh, shaving additional time off of the manufacturing process. Uh, and, and because the throughput of the clean room is obviously the rate limiting step in terms of how many, how many patients can be treated. And you know that as a research analyst, right, I'm always laser focused on cost of goods versus disease burden versus the size of the population. So what I hear you saying is that cryopreservation and multiple doses are something that you're striving for in terms of how this product may look in the future. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Cryopreservation is a critical piece of the manufacturing process going forward. It enables us to leverage a single bone aspira aspiration into multiple doses, whether it will prove to be one year or two years, uh, we, we don't know, but multiple doses obtained from a single bone marrow aspiration. And, and the, uh, the the production process from the cryopreserved cells is greatly abbreviated. So that will 
very significantly improve the efficiency of the production process as well. Okay, great. So now do me a favor, let's go ahead and let's look sure. at some data. And, and help me understand the value proposition in ALS. I, I mean, I'm very skeptical that anybody can cure ALS, but I will tell you, if you've ever heard of the Ice Bucket Challenge, one of the founders of the Ice Bucket Challenge is Patrick Quinn. Patrick Quinn was actually a retail broker at Maxim. Uh, he's a really interesting guy, and his life has been devastated by ALS, and I would tell you that he would do anything to slow down the disease progression, to allow himself to maintain the ability to speak, for example. So, you know, what I've learned as an analyst is that anything that can kind of lower the glide slope in terms of the deterioration that these people face, that the patients themselves would view that as invaluable. So with that understanding, help me understand what the strategy is going to be based on your existing data set and how you think you can take this towards approval. Sure thing. So um, if we look at the, the data from, uh, these are from the two Israeli studies. This is the phase one, two study are the uh, are a cohort of six of the 12 subjects in that study who received intrathecal cells. And the phase 2A study, which was a, a dose escalation study, um, all the subjects there received intrathecal and intramuscular administration. And ALS-FRS, for those uh, in the audience who are listening, is a very well-validated uh, scale uh, used in um, just about every ALS clinical trial. Um, is certainly a, a regulatory endpoint as well, uh, acceptable to the FDA. Um, and it is a, it is, it's a functional rating scale on a, on a range of, from zero to 48. Um, most, uh, I assume, my, you and I would be a 48 on this scale. Um, what you can see for, in, in the two studies that are presented here, uh, the phase 2A study enrolled later stage, later stage subjects, uh, whereas the IT cohort in the phase 1, 2 study uh, enrolled uh, fairly late stage subjects. On ALS-FRS, we saw actually a quite consistent result in these two, in these two studies. Um, and what we have illustrated here in blue are, is a run-in period. So we followed the subjects in, this stu in both studies for three months. During the last month, we prepared the cells and then administered them. And then we followed for six months afterwards, which is illustrated in orange. And we have here, um, for both studies, I've, I've illustrated just a, a, a simple linear regression line for the run-in period as compared to the six-month follow-up period. And for the, in both cases, we saw a highly clinically meaningful reduction in the slope, uh, meaning that the rate of disease progression slowed, um, in this case, from about a, a point, in both studies, uh, from about a point and a half, losing a point and a half a month in terms of their uh, rate of progression down to um, about 0.3 a month in the, in the phase one study and 0.6 a month in the phase 2A study. And uh, while, while these were small studies uh, and not powered to achieve a, a, any particular efficacy endpoint, um, what I can say is that this level of treatment effects, if, uh, if we will observe it in, in larger and more robust studies, uh, there is no question that uh, a 40 to 50 percent reduction in the rate of disease progression is highly clinically meaningful and, and you know, from, from a patient perspective, uh, quite a, a meaningful slowdown in the rate of disease. All right, so just to make sure I understand what I'm looking at, that blue line is the progression of these patients, and you've benchmarked that for three months. And beyond where the two lines begin is really showing what the expected rate of deterioration might be versus what looks like an arrested or a much slower rate of deterioration in the patients. Correct. So help me understand, what is the current phase two program and what are the patient numbers and what's the current uh, enrollment? When will I see data? Uh, I assume you're gonna try to replicate this with a larger N value. Sure, so the, the current U.S. study is our first U.S. study under the IND that the company filed in 2013. And the primary endpoint of this study is safety. Uh, that was the FDA's request as the, as the first study performed here in the U.S. However, we are, of course, at secondary endpoints looking at ALS-FRS as well as respiratory function uh, and, and grip strength. 
And um, the, the study design is similar in that we, we also feature a three-month run-in period follow, with six months of follow-up. Um, however, this is a 48-patient, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, so um, with a three-to-one randomization. So uh, we will have 36 uh, treated uh, uh, subjects by, the, by the study's end uh, with a comparison group of 12 placebo subjects. In terms of enrollment, uh, the study is, is moving on uh, according to uh, the expected timeline. We are approximately halfway enrolled. We expect last patient, uh, the last patient to enroll around the middle of this year. The patients are on study for nine months, which will bring the final study visit to around the end of Q1 or early Q2 of next year, and then, uh, then we'll be ready for database lock and analysis. So I'm hopeful that by the end of Q2, we'll have the top line results from this study. So, you know, one of the things that you have to be paying attention to is the changing regulatory landscape in Europe and Japan and, and hopefully coming in the U.S. Does that mean that if the safety burden here is met, and there's every reason to believe based on mode of administration and autologous cells that, you know, that, that the safety threshold here is relatively low, that if you can show a p-value out of this phase two trial, is there, a, is there the possibility that you're going to be able to sit down with regulators and talk about conditional approval? I mean, is that possible? Uh, I, I I, we, we would be in a very, very fortunate position, given the size of the study, to have a, you know, have a nice uh, p-value. It was not uh, designed to prove efficacy, and certainly we would explore uh, any and all available options in terms of accelerating the development uh, timeline for Neuron and ALS uh, with, with such data in hand, which could, in, it could include uh, certainly looking for breakthrough status or looking for some kind of accelerated approval uh, should the data warrant it. But is the alternative side of that that you should be th that I should be thinking about two matching phase three pivotal trials? Uh, I, I think in this indication, um, a a substantial pivotal single substantial pivotal study w uh, ought to be adequate uh, for to support regulatory approval. Okay, great. So let's just wrap up a little bit, and I'd like to just kind of highlight some of uh, recent data in the space, and, and without being, you know, overly direct about it, I just want to ask one question in particular. Why do you not inject directly into the spinal cord? Because I know that there are a, another company that does that, and, you know, and I, I, I just wondered, was that something that was ever considered, and is, are there reasons why you don't do that? So historically, I'm I'm not I'm not sure if it was ever considered. You know what I would say from my perspective as somebody having joined the company in June of 2014, that um, uh, given what we're seeing in terms of efficacy with the intrathecal administration, uh, any the incremental risk that would be involved in a direct administration to the spinal cord um, certainly wouldn't seem warranted. Terrific. Dr. Tony, thank you so much. We're Thanks. excited to watch the trial data. Thanks so much, Jason.